Hi, welcome to this episode of History Hunters. As you can see here, I'm in a beautiful cemetery. This is the Texas State Cemetery in Austin, Texas, which is the state capital of Texas. Join us as we visit some of the graves of some very famous people. A lot of them are governors of Texas. Join us on this episode of History Hunters. I spotted this grave from a distance because of this fantastic artwork, Willie James El Diablo, Willie James Well. He was uh, with the Negro Leagues in 1924 to 1948. He began his career with the St. Louis Stars and became baseball's first power hitting shortstop. He was an eight-time All-Star for the Stars and teams in Chicago and Newark. He also starred in Canada, Cuba, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. He was also, in 1997, inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, joining other Negro League greats. It looks like he passed away in 1989. Check out that fantastic bronze sculpture on his grave. That grave was not on my list, so that was a pleasant surprise. There are a lot of authors and writers who are in the cemetery, and this is Fred Gibson. He lived from 1908 to 1973. He was a writer and screenwriter. He is best known for writing the 1956 novel Old Yeller, which became a popular 1957 Walt Disney movie. You might have seen that one. He was actually born in a farm near Mason in the Texas Hill Country. And after a variety of farming and ranching jobs, he went to college and went to the University of Texas at Austin in 1933. He also wrote for the Daily Texan and The Ranger, but he left school before graduating to become a newspaper journalist. Here's the grave of Hugh McLeod. He was a graduate of West Point, 1835. He the Army of Texas, 1836. He was commander of the Santa Fe Expedition from 1841. Represented Galveston in the second legislature, 1847. He was a colonel of the 1st Regiment of the Texas Infantry for the Confederate States of America. He died in Dumfries, Virginia, January 2nd, 1862. There's Charles Graves Chase Untermeyer. Actually, this is where he's going to be buried. He's not dead yet. He was a state representative. He was assistant secretary of the Navy in the 80s under Ronald Reagan. Assistant to the president, George Bush. And then he was ambassador to Qatar from 2004 to 2007. He's going to be buried here. I guess people like to see their graves before they die. Cactus Richard S. Pryor, masterful humorist. Looks like he was probably on the radio here, because that's a radio. And there's a likeness of him right there. This is a very cool cemetery. Most of the people who are buried here, I guess, had some affiliation with state government here in Texas. Here's a very cool grave that I just found. I was coming up to the tall one, then I saw this one here. James Pinckney Henderson. He was the first governor of Texas from 1846 to 1847. He was a major general in the army, in charge of the Texas forces in the Mexican War, 1846 and 7. He was a U.S. senator. He died in Washington, D.C., June 1857. Now, can you imagine hauling his body all the way from D.C. to Austin, Texas to be buried in 1857. Right over here is a grave that I wanted to find. It was a friend of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Well, first let's talk about Preston Smith and his wife. He died in 2003, but Preston Smith was governor of Texas from 1969 to 1973. He has a very nice red granite or marble marker here with the Texas emblem up here. Right over here is J.J. Pickle. He was a congressman. He was a good friend of Lyndon Johnson's. Uh, one of the things that he used to do is when he would appear in parades, he would pass out these little plastic pickles to advertise his name and that was his little gimmick. James Gerald Jake Pickle lived from 1913 to 2005. And check it out. 
U.S. House of Representatives symbol here on his tombstone. Of course, his wife, Beryl, is buried next to him. The back of this marker shows that Jake Pickles served in Congress from 1963 to 1994. He was a student body president in 37. That's funny he mentions that. Lieutenant in the Navy from 42 to 45. Employment commissioner in the 60s. And he was a distinguished alumnus at the University of Texas. Why did you decide now was the time to retire? Well, I've always thought that a person in public office uh, ought to choose his time to step aside. I've been in Congress now 31 years, and I thought after that length of time, I just ought to quit and come home. So that's what I've done. Right over here is the grave of Thomas Pliny Plaster, who manned one of the twin sisters' cannon at the Battle of San Jacinto. He was a veteran of the Mexican War, 1847. As you can see, he was a native of Tennessee. He died in 1861. This was erected by the state of Texas in 1936. That was a very tall marker here. As for Edmund Davis, he was the governor of Texas from 1870 to 74. There are a lot of governors buried in this cemetery, Mr. Davis being one of them. I'm just impressed by all the dignitaries who are here. And oh my goodness, this is the kind of the main grave that I came to see. And guess who's buried here? He was U.S. Secretary of the Treasury from 71 to 72. And he was the governor of Texas. John B. Connolly. Of course, he was the governor who was riding with President Kennedy in the motorcade, and he was shot and seriously wounded. The bullet passed through Kennedy's throat and then passed through chest and ribs, broke some ribs, and then landed in his wrist. And I know for some time he was in the hospital and uh, he could not even sign his name. He had to use his other hand because it had been so badly damaged. I have a book that uh, his wife here wrote uh, detailing their experiences. Uh, John Connolly almost became president of the United States. John Bowden Connolly. As you can tell, he lived 30 years after, almost 30 years after the assassination attempt. It's a very nice black marble statue. Oh, he's got some verbiage in the back here. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. Credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is not effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows the great enthusiasms and great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at best knows the end of triumphs of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls. Know neither victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt. And as you can see, it was used in the eulogy of John Connolly. Though gravely wounded during the assassination of President John F. Kennedy on November 2nd, 1963, Connolly recovered to complete three terms as a popular governor whose enduring legacy is for the placement of education or the advancement of education for all Texans. Now, probably a lot of you don't know that in 1973, Sparrow Agnew, because of scandal, resigned as vice president and Nixon accepted the resignation. It was then his duty to appoint a successor, a new vice president. He ultimately picked Gerald R. Ford. And then, you know, in August 1974, Nixon resigned from office himself. Ford became president. What a lot of you probably don't know is that he was very strongly considering appointing John B. Connolly as vice president, which would have made him president of the United States. Connolly himself ran for president, I believe, a number of times in the 1970s and just didn't get any traction with his party. A lot of you probably also don't know that Connolly was a Democrat in the 60s and later became a Republican. So that's how he ran for president as a Republican. 
This cemetery is like the who's who of Texas politics. I just spotted one over here, uh, and I thought, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, a former U.S. Senator from Texas, is buried here, but she's not buried here. That's her grave. I'll show it to you. Her husband passed away, but she's going to be buried over here as well. There we go. Here's the grave of Ray Hutchinson, Texas House of Representatives, and this beautiful eagle up here. And there's where Senator Hutchinson has got to be buried. And she served in the U.S. Senate. She's not deceased yet, but you may hear about her passing, and this is where it's going to be. They loved and served Texas. And here we go. There's a marker here for Elton Ray Hutchinson. He served in the Navy during the Korea War. Passed away in 2014. Here's the grave of the famous coach Thomas Wade Landry. I like how people who served in World War II always make it a point to let us know that they served. He was the first lieutenant in the Army, Air Forces, in World War II. Of course, there wasn't an Air Force per se back in World War II. It was called the Army Air Forces. Apparently, this airport is right underneath the flight path for the Austin Airport. He has on his marker here a uh, passage from Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant, Tom Landry, who was a professional football player and coach. He was the first head coach of the Dallas Cowboys in the National Football League, a position he held for 29 seasons. During his coaching career, he created many new formations and methods, such as the now popular 4-3 defense and the flex defense system made famous by the doomsday defense squads that he built during his tenure with the Cowboys. His 29th consecutive years from 1960 to 1988 as the coach of one team is an NFL record, along with his 20 consecutive winning seasons, which is considered to be his most impressive professional accomplishment. Tom Landry, ladies and gentlemen. And there's this trademark hat that he always wore. I'm sure that they engraved that on his tombstone because it was a very, very familiar trademark of this coach. A memory of a pioneer patriot and statesman, Ash Bell Smith, came to Harris County, Texas in 1837 from Connecticut and was appointed Surgeon General of the Army of the Republic. He was Minister of France from 1842 to 1845. He joined General Taylor's Army in 1846 in its march upon Mexico. He was Colonel of the Second Texas Infantry, the Confederate Army. He served in the state legislature in 1866. That's one that I did not expect to find. There's just so many graves here that there's no way I'm going to be able to get to it. But this is definitely one that I just spotted I need to get to. It's funny that the claim to fame here is a teacher. This, of course, is the grave of Barbara Jordan. 1936 to 1996. She was the one who eloquently spoke during the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon. I believe she was the first black congresswoman from a southern state in U.S. history. She was also the first lesbian legislator. You may remember her eloquence when she spoke. Barbara Jordan's right here, and right over here is the grave of Stephen Austin. He is probably the most famous grave here. And it's got a little marker down here. It talks about how he was born in Virginia in 1793, and he brought the first 300 Anglo-American colonists to Texas in 1821. He became known as the father of Texas. Shortly after his appointment as Secretary of State of the Republic of Texas, Austin died of pneumonia. He was originally buried at Peach Point, Texas in 1836, and his remains were brought to this cemetery in 1910 by an active governor. Bronze sculpture was completed at the same year, in the 1910s. That goes back to... Let's go around to the front so I can show you what this looks like. This 
Stephen Fuller Austin, father of Texas. Talks about how he was born in Virginia and died in Texas, 1836. Wise, gentle, courageous, and patient, he was the founder of a mighty commonwealth. Stephen F. Austin. Entire town's named after him. I understand at one point this cemetery was in pretty rundown condition. Governor George W. Bush and his lieutenant governor helped push for the renovation of the cemetery. And it's really a beautiful cemetery. And you can tell that a lot of these older markers, uh, maybe they're gone, but there's a lot of newer markers for people who've been here for quite a while. August Buchel, I guess I'm saying that right, killed at the Battle of Pleasant Hill in Louisiana, April 15, 1864. We know that those who, for their country, die through glory live again immortally. A bred an officer of Germany, an officer in the Foreign Legion in France, knighted by the Queen for gallantry in the Carlos War in Spain, also a Pashan in the Turkish Army. There's just so many grays with symbols on here. I know I'm just gonna do it some injustice. I know I'm missing somebody. Bailey Hardiman, signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence, Secretary of Treasury of the Republic. Now this grave on the ground looks like it's probably one of the oldest ones here. It dates back to 1849. Mosley Baker and Eliza Ward Baker. She died 1849. Mosley Baker, captain of the Texas Volunteers, Battle of San Jacinto, member of Congress, Republic of Texas. And he died 1848. This marker here was erected in 1899. This, of course, is a newer marker for General Mosley Baker. Gives an entire rundown of his accomplishments. I've noticed that there's a lot of people who walk through the cemetery for exercise, they're not looking at graves, and they're just using the hills here for some exercise. Uh, it's a little after lunch. So if you watched the movie Highwaymen, uh, it was a story about the two Texas Rangers who were hunting down Bonnie and Clyde. The figure of Ma Ferguson, who was the governor of Texas, comes into play. In that movie, Kathy Bates played Texas Governor Ma Ferguson, who was involved with appointing Texas Rangers to go after Bonnie and Clyde and some other famous outlaws at that time. The real Ma Ferguson is buried right here. She was the governor of Texas after her husband, James Ferguson, was recalled from office. Let's talk first about James Ferguson, who was a governor of Texas from 1915 to 1917. He was actually indicted and impeached during his second term. He was forced to resign and barred from holding any office here in Texas. Now, unable to run under his own name, Ferguson ran his wife's campaign for governor. Miriam Ferguson was known as Ma Ferguson. If you want to know where Ma comes from, her initials were, well, her name is Miriam A. Ferguson, so they used Ma from that. She was twice elected as governor. She served two non-consecutive terms from 1925 to 1927 and 1933 to 1935. 1925, she became the first female governor of Texas after campaigning as a stand-in for her husband, James Ferguson. So he became the first gentleman of Texas for her two terms. I guess a little biographical rundown. And right here, life's race well run, life's work well done, life's victory won, now cometh rest. Miriam Ferguson, governor of Texas. Even though her husband was removed from office, during her campaign, she made it clear that she was a puppet candidate for her husband, saying the voters would get two governors for the price of one. Her speeches at rallies consisted of basically introducing him and letting him take the platform. Though a common campaign slogan was, me for Ma and I ain't got a darn thing against Pa. During the Great Depression, there was a issue with letting go of a lot of employees and Texas Rangers were no exception. The number of commissioned officers for the Texas Rangers was reduced to 45, and the only means of transportation afforded the Rangers were free railroad passes or using their horses. The situation worsened for the Rangers when they entangled themselves in politics in 1932 by publicly supporting 
Governor Ross Sterling and his re-election campaign over Ma Ferguson. Well, that didn't sit well with her, so she slashed a lot of the budget and reduced her numbers to about 32. So as a result, Texas became a pretty well-known hideout for people like Machine Gun Kelly and Pretty Boy Floyd, Bonnie and Clyde. The hasty appointment of many unqualified rangers to stop the increasing criminality proved ineffective. I don't think it's ever a good idea to form state policy based on personal grudges, but that was the case here. Well, this is definitely a grave that I wanted to find. And this talks about this being Confederate field. Soldiers were buried in the cemetery during the Civil War. Texas fought on both sides of the Civil War. While there were a few battles on Texas soil or on the Texas waters, the Battle of Palmito Ranch near Brownsville was the last land encounter in the four years. And this one is a very impressive grave, Albert Sidney Johnston. Now, if you watched my video about Fort Point in San Francisco, you'll remember that we talked about this gentleman because he was in charge of that outpost. And he is buried here underneath this. marble statue of him lying in a grave asleep. That is one very strange thing. Now he was a general in three different armies. The Texian Army, the U.S. Army, and the Confederate Army. He was in the Army for 34 years. He fought in the Black Hawk War. He fought in the Texas War of Independence, the Mexican-American War the Utah War and the Civil War. He was considered by Jefferson Davis to be the finest general officer in the Confederacy. Before the emergence of Robert E. Lee, he was killed early in the Civil War, the Battle of Shiloh, on April 6, 1862. Davis believed the loss of General Johnston was the turning point of our fate. I stuck my camera through the bars here so you can get a better look of the intricacies here shows him dead in marble. Right there is the grave of John A. Warden, who was a Major General of the Confederate States of America. He died April 6, 1865, very close to the death of Abraham Lincoln. So he came to Texas from Tennessee. He was a prominent orator, jurist, and prosecutor. Delegate for Texas Secession Convention of 1861. He joined the Confederate Army as a captain in Company B of Terry's Texas Rangers. After Terry was killed, Wharton elected colonel, and he led his famous regiment, the Battle of Shiloh, in the Kentucky Campaign of 1862. He was twice wounded and made Brigadier General for bravery. After brilliant fighting, Chickamauga Campaign valiantly led cavalry corps Red River Campaign to Prevent Invasion of Texas in 1864. You would think that this is Hollywood because I've had, I don't know, multiple tour buses come through here. The guy that's doing the history is telling the stories that I'm telling you. Only you're getting it for free. That's what History Hunters is all about. You country western fans probably recognize this name. Jerry Jeff Walker, a gypsy songman. No one else could sing the songs he sung. Left from 1942 to October 2020. He died, looks like, just a week before my mother passed away. And his wife is still living. Jerry Jeff Walker was a leading figure in the outlaw country music movement, best known for having written the 1968 song, Mr. Bojangles. Now, a lot of you may know the song, Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. It's his song. His mother made the big ball. A lot of you probably remember this gentleman, Chris Kyle. He was definitely a patriot. He lived from 1974 to actually he was killed on February 2nd, 2013. 
He was a Navy SEAL sniper. He served four tours in the Iraq War, and he was awarded several commendations for acts of heroism and meritorious service in combat. He had over 150 confirmed kills and was awarded the Silver Star, four Bronze Star Medals, as well as a number of other personal awards. So he was discharged from the Navy in 2009, and he published his best-selling autobiography, American Sniper, in 2012. And then there was a film made by Clint Eastwood starring Bradley Cooper as Kyle. It was released in 2014, a year after Kyle was murdered by Eddie Ray Routh, Rough Creek Lodge shooting range near Chalk Mountain, Texas. Routh was a former Marine with post-traumatic stress disorder and was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. And when he was shot and killed, at a shooting range. And what's very interesting is that there's hands. I'm assuming that those are the family handprints. Maybe Kyle had handprints there as well. Taya, who would be his wife. There have been a number of patriots who survived the horrors of war, the dangers of war, and they came back to the United States and they faced their own danger here. Sometimes the streets of America are more deadly than on foreign soil. Here's the grave of Cedric Benson, football player. I'll show you the backside in a moment. He died on my birthday in 2018. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's taken from Philippians 1.21. And on the backside here, he played for the Los Angeles Dodgers, University of Texas. He played for Chicago Bears, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Green Bay Packers. Now a very unique marker there, the white marble marker, belongs to Texas Governor Ann Richards, who was just before George W. Bush. In fact, I think George Bush defeated her. Now Ann Richards was the one who was known, I think she said at the 1988 Democrat National Convention, poor George, he can't help it. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Of course, she was talking about George H.W. Bush. Well, it looks like a lot of people have remembered her. She was born September 1933, and she died in September 2006. A lot of people have left some mementos here for her. Mm -hmm.